The Florida Gators take on the Kentucky Wildcats with revenge on their mind. Tonight, we preview the big-time matchup in Lexington and what the Gators got to do to walk out with the victory. This is the In All Kinds Weather Forecast. And welcome in to another episode of the In All Kinds Weather Forecast. I am your host, Chris Yanes, alongside my co-host, Neil Shulman. And we are going to be previewing our showdown with the Kentucky Wildcats in Lexington. But of course, before we do all that, I want to make sure that we shout out some of our partners as well as our merch. Make sure to go to our website and go to inallkindsweather.com slash merch and Get some of that merch you see right there on the screen that Neil's wearing tonight. You know, good opportunity to get some of that orange as we take on the Kentucky Wildcats, as well as the Gator Good Foundation, our partners that have announced their big, uh, you know, announcement for the the person who will be coming in the Arkansas Razorback game. So make sure to go check that out and support that in any way possible. Well, Neil, we got a showdown in Lexington this weekend. And the Gators, of course, are coming off two consecutive losses to the Kentucky Wildcats. The last time we were in Lexington in 2021, the Kentucky Wildcats walked out with their first victory there since 1977. And that was kind of the the beginning of the downfall for Dan Mullen that season that led to his firing later that November. And then, of course, last year, the Gators coming in that game with momentum at home after defeating Utah, ranked number 12 in the country. And they laid an egg at home. They gave up a huge pick six that led to Kentucky, that big comeback. They were down by nine points at one point in that game. And they walked out with a 10-point victory. And really the story in the last, I would say, five, six years is that Mark Stoops has kind of had Florida's number. Even in years when Florida didn't win or lose this game, there were times where it felt like we got out coached and it wasn't a very good win, even when we did win. And now that Kentucky has won three of the last five, it's safe to say they, they've gotten the best of us. And there's a big stretch coming up, Neil, here, Neil. We've got Kentucky this week, Vanderbilt at home next week, a team we lost to last year on the road. And then, of course, we've got uh, ending it with South Carolina before the bye week when we play Georgia after that. We've got to come away here with some wins and at least a 2-1 and one record in this three-game stretch to, to really solidify our chance at a bowl game, a seven-win season potentially there. But if the Gators want to really compete in the SEC East this year and make some noise, coming out with three wins against very winnable opponents, starting with Kentucky this weekend, is a big part of that. So give the fans an idea of how important this three-game stretch is going to be. Well, I mean, I guess it's time to go back to the old Greg McElroy quote that I keep citing time and again on the show. Um, the quote for those new listeners being when he was talking about what Dan Mullen had to do in his first season in 2018 at Florida, someone asked him, do you think Florida has a chance to compete for the SEC East and and beat Georgia, who had just come off of a national championship game appearance, uh, the second and 26 game to Alabama? And his response was, don't worry about Georgia. They're not your concern. Don't worry about Alabama. Don't worry about FSU, who at that point had just beaten Florida five straight times. If you're Florida, you worry about Kentucky because they have scared the daylights out of you the last several times you played them. Worry about Vanderbilt, who beat you five years ago, not that long ago, and the last three years, there was a 9-7 game that had you guys biting your nails. There was a similarly frightening 13-6 game that you very easily could have lost. And then even the 2017 game, they were in for a lot longer than they probably should have been from a talent standpoint. And worry about South Carolina, another team that just beat you last year and had had owned you for the, the better part of the 2010 decade. Those are three programs that are inferior to you from a prestige standpoint. They do not recruit at the level that you recruit at. They should not be beating you. Beginning, middle, end of conversation. Those teams should not be beating you on a regular basis or even a semi-regular basis. And yet, look at where we are right now. Florida is two and four against those three teams the last two seasons. So, Chris, here we go again. You say those teams are inferior as a pejorative Florida fan. I'm saying you as anyone with an allegiance to Florida. You think Florida is superior to those programs? You think that Florida should be beating them? Okay, do it. Beat them. Beat them. Here's your chance. 
You've got all three of them lined up in your sights these next three weeks. And here's where I'll reinsert the other talking point I like to hammer at on the show a lot. This is where they really come together. The expectations for year two under Billy Napier is progress. That's it. That's all I want. Probably some of you sick of hearing it because I say it almost every show, but I'll say it again because this is where it's going to get tested. I don't need a natty. I don't need a trip to Atlanta. I don't need a New Year's Six Bowl. I don't even need to see a nine and three season. I need to see progress. I need growth. I need development. I need signs that this program is headed in the right direction. And so of those three games against teams that we as Gator fans like to say we're better than, like you said, Chris, you got to win two of them at least. Obviously, 3-0 would be ideal because then you're sitting pretty at 6-1 and one going into, into Jacksonville and then all the stuff that you say the Gators need to be competing for every season is still on the table. But I need to see 2-1 and one in those three. Put yourself at five wins right on the doorstep of that five and a half um, barometer that Vegas has set, which I do think is ridiculously low, and beat two of those three teams head to head that Florida is supposed to be better than. Have a winning record against those three supposedly inferior programs that would show me progress. And obviously the X's and O's of what happens on the field is going to dictate all that. We'll get into that, I'm sure, um, momentarily. But big picture, bottom line, Florida has got to go two and one in these next three. So now zooming in for this game, is Kentucky a must win for Napier in Florida? No. I say I say yes. I, I, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll disagree with you. I, I'll say yes. I think this is a must win game for Napier. One, because he's only won one true road game since he arrived last year. That was the game up at College Station, which you attended. We dominated that game in the second half, and we shut him out uh, in that game uh, in the third and fourth quarter. We have got to have a similar showing on Saturday where we go in. We're a slight underdog. We've got to insert our will. And like you said, Florida is the more talented team on paper. Right now, Florida's ranked 15th in the 247 four-year composite average. Not where we want to be. Certainly, that's going to go up with a top three recruiting class coming in. But Kentucky's 31. Florida has more talent on the field this Saturday. The majority of that roster now has been recruited by Billy Napier, either through high school or through the transfer portal. It's time to exercise the will against the team that you are better than talent-wise. Now, Mark Stoops has been credited, like I mentioned, with great coaching efforts. He needs to out-coach somebody like a Mark Stoops. Mark Stoops has done a fantastic job building the program now for over a decade at Kentucky. But that is not the guy that is winning SEC championships. And if you were going to win SEC championships at the University of Florida, which is what you were brought here to do, you've got to at least outclass a guy like Mark Stoops. And last year, Billy Napier got outclassed by him at home. That can't happen again on the road with a new defensive scheme that has really taken college football by storm and the SEC as we're the number one defense right now in the conference. That is a, and I'm going to go ahead and precursor it. That's a major key to victory this Saturday. So I'm I'm asking, I, I, I do think that Billy Napier has to win this game Otherwise, the questions of whether or not he can be successful here in Florida will, will will come back to the surface like they did in week one after Utah because Mark Stoops isn't your greatest competition in this conference. He's – I don't want to say he's like the average or the mid, but you've got to beat him if you're going to have any chance in hell at being a Kirby Smart or a Brian Kelly or any of the ones at the top of the conference who have been regarded – as, as, as sort of the senior level people of the conference. So, I, I mean, I've been wrestling with the question all day because a lot of people have been uh, tweeting or Instagram messaging or whatever you have uh, just commenting. Yeah, this is a huge game. This is a must win. And I've been thinking, is it really a must win for Florida? And I think the answer is no. But if you lose this game, the next two are you must go two in one in some permutation in the next three games, ideally with the loss, not being to Vanderbilt, because that would, let's face it, that would just be humiliating to lose to them two years in a row, um, including once at home. But again, Florida needs to start showing that they can beat these types of programs consistently. There are still several more of them on the schedule. Even after this three game stretch, you still got Missouri. Who's another one that's in that category of teams you should be beating. And yet they have some good wins against you the last decade or so. Many of them by three scores or more. 
and Arkansas, another program that Florida isn't really quite as familiar with. They've only lost to them two times ever, but that's another program of that level in that caliber that should not beat you. That's coming to the swamp in a game that you should win. And historically that level of opponent recently, historically, I should say the last dozen years or so Florida just hasn't taken care of that. So I'll, I'll say because he beat Tennessee, we said that was a must win. He did that. He's gotten on the board in the rivalry department. He's not over for the rivals anymore. That, that bought him some patience. But you need to win two of these next three. And we'll talk about Kentucky in more detail because this is the Kentucky preview. But two and one in the next three is a must. You cannot go one and two in these next three. Yeah, no. It, if you look at the the next three games, kind of breaking up down opponent by com, uh, opponent by opponent, I mentioned that Kentucky is the number thirty one team currently in the composite. Florida currently, this is a we talk about percentage chance to win. According to ESPN FPI, Kentucky has a fifty one point nine percent chance of winning this game. This is a toss up fifty fifty game. The line on this game opened at Kentucky minus three and a half. That is now whittled all the way down to minus one. So this is a pick 'em. That means on a neutral site or at home, Florida would be favored to win this game. And and I think the stats certainly bear that out. I mean, Florida at every uh, category from offense to defense, as far as total yardage uh, and, and the defense and the offense side of the ball, they are doing better than Kentucky. Now look at Vanderbilt play at Florida has over a 90% chance to win that game. Of course, last year, we all know what happened. Florida had a similar uh, percentage chance to win going into that one. And we know the results can't, you know, take everything for granted, but Vanderbilt 58th in the composite. Finally, capping it off with South Carolina. And this is actually interesting, Neil. Of the three games left uh, before Georgia, Florida, according to FBI, has the least chance to beat South Carolina on the road. They give South Carolina a 56.5% chance to win the game. Now, certainly that can change over the next couple of weeks. South Carolina has a date up in Knoxville this weekend with Tennessee. Tennessee will certainly have revenge on their mind. I'm curious to see how they look. They took care of business against Mississippi State, who's probably the worst team in the SEC West this year, but they still got the win. They had to have that win if they want to get their bowl eligibility. But in order to get that, they might have to beat Florida. And South Carolina has recruited fairly well. They are now number 25 in that composite talent ranking. So not a given that it, you know, obviously the South Carolina game and you and I both said before going into the season, that one is kind of like the, the trap game, the upset alert game. Well, Florida might actually be the team, the way it looks right now in percentages, the one that actually has to pull the upset. I think that changes though, if you beat Kentucky and then of course Vanderbilt at home, if you go into that game five and one, I think Florida will be favored. I think the percentage chance will, will, will even out even more than it already is now. But I think that it's something to note that none of these games are gimmies. They haven't been gimmies in the last few years. Florida has lost to each of these three teams in the last two seasons, uh, some of them uh, twice now in Kentucky. Florida ha- can has to focus. And progress, Neil, like you mentioned, would be beating these three teams. If you beat these three teams, that gets you bowl eligibility. That gives you a chance to compete for the SEC East crown. You know, you can freshen up going into that bye week with some confidence, six and one, potentially a top 10 matchup with Georgia. That would be major going forward for Billy Napier. He would buy a ton of goodwill if he could win these next three games, knowing what's on the back half of the schedule, being that we play Georgia and Jacksonville at LSU, an Arkansas team that is not a gimme at home. And then, of course, top five ranked Florida State to finish the season. And a Missouri team that it's pretty much a 50-50 game, too, if you actually look at the FPI right now. So 6-1 and would be massive if he could pull it off. 6-1 and would be massive, and it would eclipse the win total that Vegas had before the bye week. As I said, would not be so unfathomable. Or maybe that was on the Spurs Up show I said that. Um, But, yeah, uh, Chris Phillips is talking about how – Florida was only projected to win five and a half games. And there were some people who thought four and eight or three and nine were possible. And I said, look, it it could, it could happen that way, but I think it's more likely that Florida hits that over on the over under win total before the bye week than it is that Florida goes three and nine. I think if you're going to say, all right, look, 
gun to your head, you got to pick one. Which of these two do you think is more likely? I say Florida hits it by the bye week. And here they are with three games remaining in that stretch. Obviously, three of your wins so far, or two of your three wins so far have come against your cupcakes, the ones you were supposed to beat. And in one of those cases, not in particularly um, impressive fashion. But the Florida Gators are at a point now, Chris, where all their stuff that they say every offseason that they want to accomplish, all the goals – all the accomplishments, all the achievements that they strive for every season is still in front of them. And <clears throat> if you're going to talk about Florida showing progress, you can essentially buy all the goodwill you'll need in, in year two if you win these three games. You won't need to pull an upset at LSU. You won't need to shock Georgia and sink their season in Jacksonville again. It would be great if you beat FSU, but you won't need – that win it'd be great to have <clears throat> it's not an absolute necessity to win games like that you lose two of these three games e even if you lose one even if you go two and one and you go into jacksonville five and two you got to figure that's probably going to be a loss so you think all right five and three with arkansas lsu missouri and fsu still lurking seven and five probably is gonna get most fans to be you know, okay, right track. We're on the right course here, but go eight and four. And I think a lot of the skepticism that Billy Napier's got just dies. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it, 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 this is a pivotal, pivotal stretch because it's, as I think we're talking about, it's very achievable for Florida to win the next three games, at least two of the next three, but we'd feel better about the three if we could get it. I, I we'll have to see, but I, I think that the way that they've played on defense gives some hope that it's possible. The offense, as we talked about after the Charlotte game, left a lot to be desired. As Dustin highlighted, there is a lot in the play design that has to improve for Billy Napier. We've got to try to get uh, something that goes his way in that department. And Mark Stoops, obviously, is a defensive minded coach. He's going to pose a very difficult task for Florida to adjust, but. Still, Florida, like we said, more talented team on paper, and it's time to flex your. It's time to flex your muscles. It's time to beat a team. It's time to take that next step in the program to beat Kentucky, and then therefore beat Vanderbilt for homecoming, and then finish it off with a South Carolina team who I think probably Spencer Rattler at least is what's carrying that team. Without Spencer Rattler, who knows where South Carolina would be? I'm very curious to, when when that game comes up if we can get Chris on to talk about kind of where South Carolina is now because it is a very – it's a weird season that they're having. They had a difficult – even tougher front-end schedule than Florida had, whereas like their back-end schedule isn't as difficult as what ours has been uh, or what ours will be on the back end. But – so that, I think that, that really sums up what, what the precursor, what the storyline going into this game is. It's the start of a three-game stretch that can make or break Florida's season. So – with all that being said, let's get into Kentucky. Let's get into who they are and what they bring to the table. And, you know, I think with Kentucky, it starts with Devin Leary, right? Devin Leary, the NC, NC State transfer, Florida. A lot of Florida fans were saying, why did we pursue Devin Leary? Devin Leary has a cannon of an arm. And if you actually look at what Kentucky has done this year, they are hitting all of their scores on big plays explosive plays. They're one of the most explosive teams in college football. They're one of four teams right now with a 50% explosive hit rate uh, for their play. So they are doing things right now that can pose problems for an Austin Armstrong defense that prides itself on being sort of aggressive and aggressive defenses can be susceptible to explosive plays. But that of course means you have to game plan for it. So Devin Larry already has thrown over a thousand yards this year. He is thrown nine touchdowns, five interceptions, but his completion percentage is at 58%. Look at Graham Mertz, who now has a completion percentage of well over 70%. He is the first Florida quarterback in a four game stretch since Kyle Trask did it in November of 2020 to have to actually pose a four consecutive uh, game streak of 70% passing or more. That certainly can play in Florida's favor there. So, that's that's Devin Leary. You know, he is kind of a boomer bust player, at least the, the first four games. But one of the things, Neil, that I think is interesting to me is Kentucky has given up a ton of sacks against opponents that are far inferior. Now, 
Kentucky, if you look at the score sheet, has beaten every team they've played by double digits. They ran through Ball State 44-14. They looked kind of lackluster against Eastern Kentucky, an FCS opponent, kind of like the way we did with Charlotte, the only one that won 28-17. They defeated Akron 35-3, and then they started SEC play with a 45-28 victory over Vanderbilt. But if you dig deep into the stats, they didn't have over 400 yards of offense, and they did turn the ball over twice in that game. So not a perfect outing for them, despite what the score may indicate. They hit some of those big plays like I'm talking about. Neil, what do you think thus far of kind of what Kentucky has done? They they certainly show on offense that they can hit the big plays. Their defense has beaten inferior opponents up pretty well. But what do you what do you what are you looking for in this team as we preview this matchup? Oh, Chris, how very nice of you to not touch on the one thing that I was going to harp on um, in, in my my little monologue here. You left it all you left it all open for me. Kentucky has a turnover problem. They've turned the ball over five times against bad competition. Now, the obvious, the other side of that, of course, is Florida hasn't really excelled at taking the ball away this year themselves. But if you think about that, you turn the ball over five times against Ball State, Eastern Kentucky, Akron, and a Vanderbilt team that's not as good as they were last year. I mean, they weren't great last year, but this team is worse. Five turnovers against that level of competition, and now you suddenly take the step up to facing a much, much more athletic Florida team than anything you face so far – to, I mean, the the windows are going to be smaller for Devin Leary to throw the ball to. Granted, he did play at NC State before this year, so it's not like he's totally unfamiliar with the idea of, of small windows. But still, the jump from four weeks of inferior competition to, oh, wow, the Florida Gators, they have five stars on that team. They have four the high four stars on that team. They have a top – what is it, fit top 15 team in the talent composite? Windows are going to be smaller. The players are going to be faster and stronger. Attempts to punch the football out are going to be more likely to be successful than they are from smaller guys on Akron and Eastern Kentucky and Ball State. And it, it just, even at home, even you know with their home field advantage, with the crowd getting into it, uh, I mean, maybe they won't have the the false start issues, obviously, that Tennessee had on the road, for example, or, or more uh, – more relevant here, the issues that Florida had the last time they went to Kentucky, uh, trying to get the snap off in time and just not fall starting. Even without that working against Kentucky, it does feel like them taking a big step up in competition after four opponents of lesser caliber is not going to work in their favor. The other side of that equation, though, is that I mean, Chris, we we know Kentucky's going to save their best for us. We know that if we're going to beat Kentucky, we're going to have to beat them at their very best. This is their Super Bowl. And that's not even me taking a shot at them. That's not a knock. That's a, hey, Florida, you should know that, and you should match that intensity type of statement I'm making. There's no excuse for that. That's not a reason to lose to a team. No, if at some point you decide that you get tired of losing to a team, then go out and show that you're tired by playing your best ball. Yeah, I mean, we've gotten our best shot for them after beating them for 31 consecutive years. The last five, they've won three of them, and and really four were close games uh, that we could have very well lost that 2019 game. Of course, everybody remembers that was the coming out party for Kyle Trask, where he miraculously saved Florida after the Felipe Franks injury. Yeah, I mean, I guess we just start wearing it as a badge of honor that Kentucky consider, considers us their Super Bowl, right? I mean, it, it, the fact that Florida has really been – Average the last over the last decade since Urban Myers left. We've only played for three SEC championships, haven't won one. We've got a few New Year's Six Bowls to show for it. But, you know, we, we've dropped a little bit in the prestige of college football, yet Kentucky still consider considers us one of the big dogs. And, you know, we'll take that as a badge of honor. But should know? we? Should we really? Because we should be the team that is blowing them away. At least if you look at the well, talent. No, of it. course. No, of course. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that, like, I'm just being sarcastic. Like, if they really want to treat us like a Georgia or an Alabama, or, we're like, that is your, that for us, that is our Super Bowl. When we go to Jacksonville every year, when we play Alabama on the schedule, when we go face LSU, those are our big games, right? Well, then we should play like it. Well, no, I, I look, I'm with you. Totally with you. Like that's why we're previewing this podcast. But I'm just I'm just being facetious and saying, you know what? If they want to treat us like a Super Bowl, then damn it, we'll give them a Super Bowl. And then that's gotta change. That's gotta happen here. That's changing of the guard. It's gotta be Billy Napier recaptures that. And if you look at the SEC East right now, there's an argument to be made Florida's the second best team in the East. 
at this present time. Like we beat Tennessee by two, you know, scores. Can, by two scores. Kentucky hasn't played anybody yet. They beat Vanderbilt. That's not that special. If we beat Vanderbilt next Saturday in the swamp for homecoming, that's the standard. That's the way it should be. Like whatever. Like it's it's another team on the schedule. And that's I, my I, point, Chris, with with letting letting uh, letting a smile come across our face because Kentucky considers us worthy of being a Super Bowl, even even with the degree of sarcasm the statement was delivered with. Beating Kentucky should be the norm. It should be the standard. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't take any solace in like even if we beat them and we go, yeah, you know what, we took Kentucky's best shot and we beat them. That should still be the standard because we did it 31 times in a row and then again two more times after they finally got lucky and said, all right, blip on the radar, whatever. So that the 31 game streak is gone, but now it's 33 of the last 34. So yeah, no, we own this rivalry. In the last couple of years, Chris, hasn't been the case. And here's what here's what gets me worried. It hasn't even been that Kentucky's beaten Florida as much as it is that Florida's beaten Florida. In those Agreed. couple of games. And that has been a trend that we have continued to see play out so far this season. Yeah, I would say that if you look at the three wins that Kentucky's had, the one where they truly just outplayed us, outcoached us was the one in the swamp in 2018. That was the one I felt that they just went in and kicked our butt. The the last two, the one in 2021, Kentucky doesn't win that game if Florida doesn't have 15 procedural penalties and the block kick return for the kick six, whatever you want to call it now. And then the fo- and then the following year, we're up nine points in that game. And then Anthony Richardson decides to throw a lackadaisical pick six, which turns the game on its head. So I think Florida, yes, you're right. The last two we've let get away. The 2020 or the 27 or 18 game, I would say Florida lost that game straight up. And I hope obviously Saturday that that's not the case in either regard. But yeah, I would agree. Something to note moving forward into this game as we look at it. So all right. We've kind of, we've given, I think we've, we've really gotten deep into that, but, you know, just to kind of put a wrap on it, Kentucky is a team that is certainly explosive on offense, but like you mentioned, prone to the turnover. They're about to play, face a defense that hasn't forced a lot of turnovers right now. Thus far, we we still only have one turnover for the entire year. That was the Devin Moore interception on a hit that, I mean, it was, it wasn't, it was a, a duck of a throw because uh, Desmond Watson got in the backfield and just nailed Joe Milton. And that's our lone interception of the year. Florida has turned it over a little bit, but they have, I think for the most part, been okay. They don't have the turnover problem that Kentucky has. They don't have the sacks problem that Kentucky has. Kentucky has allowed a lot of pressure. And as we've talked about, we've seen some improvement with our pass rush in the last two games, specifically against Tennessee and Charlotte, where we've, we're starting to get in the backfield. We're starting to get the sacks. We're starting to get pressure of the quarterback. It did force the one turnover. Can Florida do that again in this game with guys like Princey Uman Yellen, uh, with guys like Cam Jackson, Desmond Watson, as we mentioned, getting in the backfield? Uh, and then, you know, you look at our linebackers who have played very disciplined football. They've, they've stuffed the run. Florida has been incredible against the run this year. And if you take away Kentucky's run game, which in the past has beaten Florida, you, you then have to you force them to hit the big plays down the field. And the safeties this year for Florida have limited the big play. Uh, look at a freshman like Jordan Castell, who has played lights out back there. If Devin Moore is healthy, we'll probably our best corner. It'll see if, you know, what his impact is for this Saturday's game. But I think if you just look at Kentucky, the, for the key for them to win this game is really if they hit the big play. And then, of course, if Florida doesn't beat themselves on the offensive side of the ball, spotting Kentucky short fields, special teams mishaps, as we've seen this year and in other previous years against Kentucky and other opponents, how we've lost games. Special teams can't lose us this game either. Looking at the Florida side now, Neil, you know, Graham Mertz has been, like I mentioned, spectacular. He's throwing over 70% completion percentage in his first four games. The first four game stretch since Kyle Trask in 2020. He hasn't lit the world on fire. You know, I think he's he basically hasn't lost Florida a game, which is kind of what we expected him to be, a really solid game manager. He's done a fantastic job doing that. We have our thunder and lightning between ETN and Montreal Johnson, who are carrying the rock for us. And there's been a lot of debate this week about who should be getting the majority of the carries. A lot of talk that ETN might be supplanting Montreal Johnson in that role and that Florida was really just kind of resting him after a 23 carry performance against Tennessee. 
the receivers have been the ones where we see the talent, the ability, and we will likely get Eugene Wilson back in this game. But the route running, the concepts have limited this vertical passing attack. And that may be something Florida has to hit on in order to win this game because Kentucky's probably going to – Charlotte put the blueprint out how you beat Florida. You load the box. You force them to throw the ball. Get them in those third and long situations similar to what happened to Florida against Utah. And the offense becomes incredibly limited, and it makes Graham Mertz have to sit back there and deliver throws deep down the field, which he has not been able to do. Not necessarily in large part because of him, but maybe the concepts with Florida. So, Neil, looking at Florida, what is your what are your thoughts about what we bring to the table for this matchup? Well, I, I mean, Florida is going to be bringing superior talent, as we talked about um, at, at nauseum, really not even just the first bit of tonight's show. But we've been talking about this for ever now that Florida, while, yes, Dan Mullen was fired because he didn't recruit at a high enough level for the Florida Gator fan base to be happy with and thus to compete with Georgia and LSU and Alabama. The fact is, even Mullen recruited at a, at a level that's high enough for Florida to beat Kentucky. They just didn't show it on the field when the two teams met face to face. So. What I'm looking for first and foremost is to see Florida's trench game just dominate Kentucky's because it's there there have been individual plays the last couple of years where yes, Florida got the better of Kentucky in the trenches, but there have been a lot more plays where that didn't happen. And that's just not the way it's supposed to go. Florida is going to be the more talented team pretty much everywhere you look on the field, including at the line of scrimmage, but that doesn't necessarily translate to results. What I want to see is for that to happen. I want that to translate to results. Florida is bigger than Kentucky. Florida's offensive line, especially now that they get uh, Ms. Kua back, um, Damian George will be back for the full game. Kingsley is expected to be back. Austin Barber has been playing the whole year. He'll be there. That offensive line should have its way with Kentucky's defensive line. Let's see them do that. Uh, and, and on the defensive side, too, Cameron Jackson, Caleb Banks, uh, Prince Lee, Mon Mielin, those guys are just better than the offensive line for Kentucky. I mean, look at their at their starting lineup um, on the offensive line. I think it's it's from left to right. It, it's Marquez Cox, Dylan Ray, uh, Jagger Burton, Eli Cox, and Jeremy Flax. I and mean, that, that's a good offensive line, but – those aren't players that you expect to be winning one-on-one -on -one battles with the likes of Caleb Banks, Prince Lee, Amon um, you know, anyone else who may come onto the field for Florida, like, like a Tyreek Sapp, um, who's maybe not the, the household name of the defense, but certainly can play at a high level. You just don't expect Kentucky to be able to hold their own with Florida. And that needs to be what we see take place on the field on Saturday. And if you do that, I think Florida is going to win the game. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think the it's pretty simple. If Florida is able to, you know, control the ball, they're able to limit mistakes. I I, I don't see. I think Kentucky is going to have to hit some big plays in this game to win this to win. I, I really do. I don't. I, I think Florida really. It's kind of you don't let get it big. Those big chunk plays take it away, and then they're going to have to stay ahead of the chains on the offensive side of the ball. Florida has been pretty good in certain situations in those second and long, long to second and short uh, situations. They got to take advantage of those moments. They can't get in third and long because I, I suspect at that moment you've got punts and you give the ball back to Kentucky. And the more times you give the ball back to Kentucky, they're going to have a chance to hit that big play inevitably. And we, and like I mentioned at the top of the show, the percentages that they've been able to hit explosive plays. So just, you know, I, I that to me, that's the key ball control, limiting mistakes on your end and for god's sakes do not lose this game on special teams again uh, we've got the field goal kicking i think ironed out knock on wood punting slight improvement last week but then making sure you have your personnel out there no more of this 10 guys crap you know like have the guys ready to go no mistakes and getting guys out there and lined up and then the penalties and, and you know, we, like I'm, we lost a game two years ago in Kentucky with procedural penalties alone, like alone. You take that out in Florida, take out half of those penalties. Florida probably wins that game in 2021. Maybe we're having a whole different conversation today, right? How the arc of history may have changed in Florida football because we lost that game and had 15 procedural penalties. It was an indicative thing though, that was going on in the program at the time. 
Florida's been fairly well in the penalty mark department in the last three games. It's got to continue in this game tonight. So, all right, Neil. Well, we'll. I think we've kind of given the storylines of what can Florida brings to the table, what Kentucky brings to the table. I think it's time to get into our preview now. Before we go any further, got to shout out our merch store. We've got new merch that is comfortable, lightweight for those hot summer days. Makes it clear to everyone you come across which team you pull for. From 100% polyester workout tees to soft style cotton tees, sport tech polos, quarter zips, hoodies, beanies, baseball caps, trucker hats, koozies, tumblers, and more in all kinds of weather has just the gear you're looking for this football season. Our in all kinds of weather gear is sold in four colors, orange, blue, black, and white. And it all features that sleek new alligator logo that pays homage to all your favorite moments in Gator history. So don't wait. Get yours today. Go to inallkindsofweather.com slash merch to get yours now. That's inallkindsofweather.com slash merch. And as you can see, that merch is on display right here, right now on this pod. I can tell you just because I'm wearing it, it, it's very comfortable. Chris, you actually have one too. You've worn it for shows before. You you can attest it's. Uh, I, it's I have blue. worn it, but it's blue, and we're not allowed to wear blue this week. Thus, why I'm wearing an orange T-shirt from Homefield. I do love Homefield. Shout out Homefield. They're good to us. We're good to them. Uh, but you know, upgrade your uh, your closet with some you know, kinds of weather merch. Certainly, that unique Gator logo is fantastic. So, uh, and make sure to also. Like and subscribe to our show here tonight. Leave us a comment, rate, review at the bottom. Helps us grow, helps us reach more of a wider audience so we can bring you great Gator content. All right, Neil. So let's talk about keys to the game. Well, let's get into let's get into the final verdict here. Keys to the game. How do the Florida Gators walk into this big three-game stretch coming up here with the first big victory to getting to that six and one mark by the end of it? I mean, broadly, I think the answer is just don't beat yourself. It's just don't beat yourself. The procedural penalties, you can talk about not running on the field with two guys wearing the same jersey number, which you may think, okay, you're beating a dead horse that happened a month ago. This is Florida's first road test since that happened. You never know. When you're on an unfamiliar sideline, you haven't really walked on those square feet of, of grass before. You just might lose your head for a second and miss something like that. It could happen. Uh, where Florida – lines up with eight guys on a field goal attempt. And this time it gets blocked and returned for a touchdown, which we saw happen with 11 guys two years ago. And then there's the issue that I, I posted on Twitter uh, last night. It, it's that that's really frightening. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it on the screen. If you're listening to this on podcasts, uh, go find the cut up of the Florida Charlotte game on YouTube and go to about seven minutes, 45 seconds left in the third quarter, two receivers running routes, directly into each other, wiping each other out. They both fall down, completely Chernobyling the play. Embarrassing. That That's just embarrassing, and it just can't happen if you're an SEC program with the prestige of the Florida Gators. Now, is it as embarrassing as two players blocking each other? No, but it is up there. Uh, oh, yeah, and I don't, I don't want to hear from FSU fans who are going to be troll listening to this or troll watching this. Y'all do it far more than we do. You've been caught on tape doing it way more than Florida has. So you might want to sit this one out. But nonetheless, more needless, avoidable, self-destructive behavior that comes from either players not knowing the playbook, which is certainly not a settling possibility, or even worse, just bad play design that has guys naturally running their routes into the same vicinity, which is quantifiably more unsettling. And then there's the play calling issue, which is an entirely different discussion that's going to take up another hour and a half or two hours worth of podcast time on its own. But things like that where Napier is just, he's too smart for his own good. He's out thinking himself and just putting Florida in bad positions all that has to stop. And I know it's very broad and I know it's a very wide range of things I'm talking about, but if Kentucky comes out and they just make plays like Dane key a year ago, making a great catch over Jalen Kimber, if that happens, okay, fair enough. Shake the guy's hand. You made a great play. Okay. It happens. Beat us. I can't stand watching Florida beat themselves. However, and whatever form it's going to take, it's just got to stop happening. Yeah, no, it does. And, I don't think there's going to be a major 
change in play calling or tactics until the off season. We talked about the need for a play caller. New play caller is not coming in this game. So what can he do to scheme open guys? You know, he's found success with people like Eugene Wilson, who's returning. I think that the run game and the pass pro is a lot more effective when a guy like Kingsley starting at center, we're going to get him back there. He's an incredibly important player. That offensive line looks very different without him. It looked very different without three starters. Of course, we get Mascua also back at right guard this week. That's huge. So Florida, I think a big key is going to be, can they run the ball behind that big offensive line? And then how do we react when inevitably Kentucky starts loading the box with eight, nine guys, which Mark Soups has done in the past, has found success against Florida with it. Does Billy Napier have something cooked up in his playbook where he can then, okay, I can't run the ball here. Either I've got to come up, I've got to be a master schemer in the run game and scheme open runs. He's been that that's one thing that w- opposite of the passing game, which we've criticized at length here now. He is incredibly good at scheming open the run game. So what does he do there? And then, or how do you generate a passing attack down the field for Graham Mertz and giving him enough time to have things open up downfield and deliver those passes is huge. And, and we'll see what we'll see if he's able to do that. I think when we get to predictions, we'll talk about our score predictions and what we think is going to happen in this game. But this is probably going to be a situation where it is a slugfest. The defenses are are the best defense is going to win this game. It's going to be lower scoring. And Florida's just going to have to stick it out one way or another. And and it's limiting that big play, like I mentioned. If, if, If Kentucky has, and this is a stat I'll give you, if Kentucky has four explosive plays of 30 yards or more, they're going to win this game. I would, I mean, maybe even three, but I I would say limited to four and Florida under four will win this game. If they're able to do that, I think Kentucky will score. They'll get down the field, but then it's moments. Okay. How do you react then? If they get a 30 yard gainer or plus, do you, do you hold them to a field goal or do they get in the end zone? Those are the keys because I think point. I just I do think this is a game. It's got it's got that uh, that fourteen six type twenty fifteen or four was that fourteen nine and twenty fifteen that kind of game written all over. In my opinion, I think it's just going to be a really tight matchup. It's going to be kind of a grinded out game, and if Florida's going to have to limit those big plays and they're going to have to take advantage of short fields if they're afforded them. So it's a field position game. Ultimately, it's probably a field position game. Yep. Field position is going to determine it. Special teams going to determine it. Um, Got to think that how Florida does in the uh, in the trenches is going to have a lot to do with it. Again, though, I mean, to me, it just comes down to just don't beat yourself. It, I'm begging Florida, just don't beat yourself because you've seen them do it in so many different ways. That's the thing that's got me so spooked about this kind of game. You've seen so many different things that all fall under the categorization of self-destruction that Florida has done this year and the last two years against Kentucky, whether it's Richardson throwing basically two pick sixes because one was returned down to the five yard line that turned into another touchdown. Um, the, the block kick that goes for six the other way. There's just, there's nothing that Florida can really do at this point to self-destruct. That would surprise me. Cause I think I've seen it all from them in the last two games against Kentucky and the first four games this year. Again, on talent, Florida should win. Florida is the more talented team, and you should be playing angry. You should be playing motivated. You should be playing with intensity because you should be sick and tired of losing to these guys. But then again, there is something to say about a team like Kentucky that just gives you their best shot every year. They they come with a street fighter mentality, and they're just not going to go down that easily. So you have to be able to deliver the best shot you can possibly deliver too. Just please don't beat yourself in the process, guys. That's that's all I ask for because I've seen it happen so many times in so many different fashions. I'm yep. I'm just I'm yep. beaten into submission, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, Florida, it, we saw it against Utah. We've seen it against Kentucky the last few years. We saw it against Vanderbilt last year. We beat ourselves. We made mistakes, whether it was in special teams, whether it was pet procedural penalties, whatever it may be. 
it costs us dearly. And in order for Florida to take that next step, they're going to have to eliminate that. And I, th- I think that the bigger picture is that right now, the way Florida is constructed as a team, there's little margin for error still. Then that's sort of been a theme of Florida the last couple of seasons. There was margin. There was not a lot of margin for error for an offense to have a bad night in 2020 because how bad the defense was. In 2021, it was that the talent pool had dropped off dramatically when you had the departures of guys like Kyle Trask, Trevon Grimes, Kadarius Toney, Kyle Pitts. And then there wasn't really even anything left on the defense either. And then you look last year, it was the fact that our defense was once again abysmal on third down. They limited Florida's opportunities while they had a very explosive offense. They didn't give them enough opportunities to score or the special teams lost us a game like Vanderbilt. And then this year, procedural penalties and some special teams mistakes, miscues up at Utah. Some of those issues seem to have been remedied in the last three games. We're going to find out against Kentucky if it is on the road. Um, when you play on the road, your I think weaknesses are amplified. And Florida's weaknesses were amplified up in Salt Lake City. We'll find out if those weaknesses still remain on this team. I, the one that I, I think is just concerning for me is just the inability to have a downfield passing attack when teams load the box up against you and stop the run. ETN and Montreal Johnson are great running backs. Maybe the, maybe the best duo in the SEC, mm-hmm. but they can't run against nine-man fronts time in and time out. They're going to have to find a way to get the ball matriculated down the field in other ways, and part of that is developing some sort of downfield passing game, and I think it's going to be Florida's cap this year of being more than what they could have been with this really stout defense is capping themselves with a a, a poor passing attack. And, and that's just one of the many things that, honestly, I do put that in the self-destruction category because Napier, as the play caller and the head coach, has the ability to do something about that. If you see a team that is repeatedly playing cover zero against you with seven or eight man boxes, maybe you should do something. You should put something on film. You should run plays. You should design plays that are going to naturally beat those looks. You shouldn't just say, well, you know what? My offensive line is bigger, so my five can block your seven and and Trevor Etienne or Montreal Johnson can get the three tough yards. No, you have to get them out of the box by designing some downfield passing plays. Florida just just doesn't seem to have them in the playbook, or, or maybe they do, and it's a bit of gamesmanship by Billy Napier to not show them until Kentucky. Maybe he even had them in his back pocket for Tennessee and just chose not to show them because Florida was down seven, nothing early, but then they reeled off 26 points in a row and got themselves back on top. So they didn't really need you. Maybe it's just brilliant gamesmanship by Napier to just not display it and save it for a game like Kentucky, which does strike me as somewhat unlikely, but <clears throat> I, yeah, I don't, I don't find it likely. Anytime people say, "Oh, we're just saving it for the big yeah. opponent," it's like, no, typically, I don't not. think it's, it's likely. The but I, but, it, but it's possible. So I'm saying I'm, I'm reserving, I'm, I'm holding off on on just lambasting him for this because we haven't seen the Kentucky game play out and thus don't have the data point that says he was not doing this. Kentucky he should have done it against Utah. Goes, I mean. Sure. Utah was a major opponent to start the season against a, a team that's undefeated mm-hmm. in top 10 right now. That's the time you should have. I know it's the first game, but you should have brought it out then. I, I, I don't know. What you put on tape I'm, is what you put on I'm tape. I'm with you. Hey, I'm with you. I'm just saying that we can't use that against Napier without having seen the Kentucky game play itself out. Because if yep. Kentucky game comes and goes and, and, and he runs the same offense without a single downfield pass – more than 12 or 15 yards or so down the field, then we can go, all right, there's nothing to be saving it for. This is SEC play, and you're still not doing it. No, this is what your offense is. This is on you. This is your fault, and this is clearly what the cap of this offense is. You just talked about cap a few minutes ago. This is the ceiling that this offense is going to hit, and that's specifically on you because you had a whole offseason to do something about it, and you didn't do it. So, But again, to me, that all comes back to the same thing of beating yourself. That's Napier beating himself and beating his own program from Monday to Friday. That's him beating his own team in the film room. That's him beating his own team in his office when his players are, I don't know, eating dinner or they're at class or they're sleeping. And he has one of those long nights that coaches are famous for in the SEC. And he's just messing with his offense. He's looking at 
at uh, you know at, at a whiteboard or looking at a piece of paper if he still draws plays up that way and decides, yeah, you know what, let's just run four slants on the same play on a third and seventeen, and we'll we'll think that'll be the, the the good play call to go to here, and then the team just you know they they call the play and it doesn't get a first down. Surprise, surprise, and well now Florida has to punt. So like that's another example of Napier beating Florida, whether it comes. On Tuesday night, on Saturday at 1.30 p.m. with two minutes to go in the first half, no matter what, I need to see a game where Florida puts itself in the position to win the game, not putting itself behind the eight ball and hurting itself and giving the other team the upper hand. I'm I'm just I'm so sick of seeing that with the Gators the last couple of years. I'm, I'm just I, I've hit a breaking point with that. Well, hopefully Saturday will be the uh, the beginning of the end of that breaking point in a new chapter and where we start ascending once again. But all right, so I years. think we, yes, amen to that. So I think we've gotten to the keys of this game, and really, it's don't beat yourself. Uh, there's other factors like we talked about: field position, controlling the clock, not making big mistakes. You know, giving Kentucky a short field. But now let's get into kind of the predictions of this. So Neil, give me. Uh, a player that you think is a, a kind of a player that will make the difference in this game for Florida. And then we'll get into our scores. So I'll go with the guy that I think a lot of Gator fans have been talking about being a playmaker as far back as when he first committed. And that's Eugene Wilson, Trey Wilson uh, made an impact against Utah in the little amount of time that he played made a nice impact the little bit that he played the last time he stepped on the field for the Gators. The first drive against Tennessee, he was responsible for, what, like 40 yards worth of offense on just five or six touches, so that's great. Let's see if he can go a full 60 minutes and and hopefully stay healthy, which is obviously not totally in his control, but let's see what he can do in a full 60 minutes of football with – him being the guy that gets the ball the most with him being a clear feature part of the offense. And obviously you, you got to feature Ricky Pearsall. You got to feature Trevor Etienne on the ground. You got to keep Andy Jean, you know, involved in the game, maybe get all the sporting hands and touches, but I want to see what happens when Trey Wilson is the focal point of the Gator offense for a full 60 minutes. Yeah. I like that one. I mean, Eugene Wilson's an obvious one. I'm going to go with Trevor Etienne. On offense, I think Trevor Etienne, if he he took a kind of a back seat in the Charlotte game, I think it was load management from the staff a little bit there. He is going to have to have a big game, I think, through the ground and finding you know those yards after contact that he was able to do against Tennessee that really just helped the offense explode. And if he's successful running the ball, that's going to get Kentucky hopefully to kind of creep in and maybe some downfield stuff does open up because of it. So to me, I like ETN, you know, hopefully having a big game and being the catalyst for the offense to be successful. All right. Defense. Let's go defense here really quick. My guy for the defense, Jordan Castell. I mentioned him toward the top that Florida has, he's limited some big plays this year, especially in that Tennessee game. Can he limit the big play, that's explosive offense, those deep balls that are going to come from Kentucky? Devin Leary's got a cannon of an arm. He can th- stretch the field. Don't get beat. And I think Castell has the ability to, to hold the back in there in coverage and limit those big plays to hopefully keep those big, you know, those 30-yard gainers under four. He, is to me, is the key for that one. It's a good pick. Um to me, flip a coin between our two linebackers, Scooby Williams and Shamar James. Uh, I'll go with James, I guess, just because he's younger, just because Scooby has put more stuff on film, I guess. But you could make an equally sound argument for either one of those two because they, they are quietly growing into one of the better linebacking combos in the SEC and in the country, really. And they've, they've both got more time to grow into – tremendous linebackers for the university of Florida, which of course has a a very decorated history of that. And it feels like this is the kind of game where they could break out, I guess, onto the national scene and national stage and really announce themselves 
as fearsome linebacking tandems. So, I mean, Shamar James is just, he's just so solid. He doesn't really make any mistakes. He's always around the ball. He's always wrapping up, going for the sure tackles, bringing guys to the ground. He doesn't really go for those, those highlight hits unless he's absolutely positive. He'll drop the guy to the ground. He won't, you know, t- take the highlight reel attempt shot and miss. And then the guy goes for a six yard game. No, he does all the little things right. Um, and, and Scooby Williams too. I mean, they're both just two guys who do everything that they're supposed to do. They're gap sound. They're just intelligent. They can kind of diagnose plays before they even really get started. I need to see big games from them in an SEC contest away from the swamp. If we see that, not only does that bode well for Florida in this game, it tells me that Florida is in really good hands for the rest of the season. It's not just a fluke that we've seen Florida have just one good game against a, a good opponent um, in, in Tennessee's offense. Um, and the other games were just because they didn't face good opponents with Utah's B team and McNeese and Charlotte. So show me this against Kentucky with these linebacking guys, and I will be feeling a lot better about the rest of the season. It is scary to note that this defense hasn't really reached its full potential yet and how young it is. The guys making the plays are folks that are going to be back next year. Castell, Scooby Williams, Shamar James, Devin Moore, you know, all along the defensive line for the most part too. You could theoretically could have this whole defense back next year. It It is kind of scary to think about that, how good an elite they could be. We could get back to the level of that defensive play that we got very accustomed to. Uh, at Florida, the nineties, the two thousands, winning the championship, even in, in you know in, through the the twenty tens, I it, I think that defense hopefully is on its way back, and, and and it's the young guys that are bringing it back. So cool that we're shouting out young guys that are contributing. As we we mentioned, two freshmen, two sophomores, yeah, that that's pretty cool. I think that's a pretty cool thing. Actually, I guess three sophomores because uh, ETN as well. All right, so let's get down to it. We've got our predictions. Neil, give me percentage chance the Gators have to win and give me your score prediction. Percent chance to win. I'm going to reluctantly say Florida with a very low degree of confidence. I'll say 51. Just because we haven't seen the team on the road since the Utah game, and that game was an absolute disaster. So I do think Florida will be better prepared. I think that Florida will give a better effort um, than they gave against Charlotte. I think that they will play more fundamentally sound than, than they played um, against Utah. And I don't think we'll see any of the catastrophic self-destructions like we saw against Utah either. So I think that Florida will finally take Kentucky seriously. The issue is again, that Kentucky has been sort of resting up and gearing up for this game. They don't, they haven't gone through the grind of facing tough competition week in, week out before facing us. So they're, for the most part, they're rested, they're ready to go, and they're fully healthy. And they do have some of the playmakers back that they had uh, in the last couple of years against us. Dane Key, the guy, for example, who who mossed Jalen Kimber on that touchdown bomb from Will Levis, which is probably one of like three plays that actually went well for them last year in offense. But he's back on the road – I'm going to take Florida. Um, it's it's just so it's so difficult for me to make this pick, but I'm going to say Florida 28 to 24. I'm I'm taking a leap of faith in Billy Napier. All right, I like it. Well, to preface this really quick, our differences in vic- margin of victory is the same. I think Florida does get the job done on Saturday. I but I do give it a 50. I'm going to say 52 percent chance. I do – Billy Napier, one of the things that impressed me the last two games, and if you watch those Our Journey uh, segments that they put on YouTube and the post game and Napier addressing the team, he – the last two games has immediately – well, after the McNeese game, he immediately jumped to Tennessee. And after the Charlotte game, he immediately jumped to Kentucky. That mindset he's trying to instill in the players, okay, these are teams that got us last year. In order for us to get to where we want to go, we got to beat these teams – the shift in mindset to me is the difference in the team this year between winning seven, eight, nine games and only winning maybe five or six, like people have talked about. I, I think that that certainly plays a, a role in this. Also, we didn't talk about it all tonight. This is a noon game. It's a noon kickoff. I think that actually plays in Florida's favor 
because we've gone to the last several times we've gone to Lexington. It's been primetime games. I don't remember the last time we actually played a game in Lexington during the day. I, I think we'd have to go back into the 2000s, actually, to think of a time where we went to Lexington and it was not a primetime kickoff. 2007, it was a CBS game. There you go, the 3.30 game. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So it's been a long time. I think that that helps Florida. I, I'm i not saying the crowd won't be there. I think it will be there. It's slightly bigger crowd and capacity than what we saw up at rice Eccles Stadium in Utah. But I don't, because it's a noon game, it, the atmosphere is going to be different. Even us, us fans that go to games in the Swamp know a noon atmosphere is very different than a 7 o'clock atmosphere. I think Florida does get the job done, though. I think they make enough plays in this game. I think the defense is what ultimately wins Florida this game. And I got the Gators winning by a score of 17 to 13. I think this is a slugfest. I think this is a nail biter. I think this is a game where Florida might have to make a stop at the end to win it. I do think Florida controls the game. I I, I could see this being like 17, six, maybe Kentucky throws on a touchdown at the end, makes it interesting, but Florida is going to have to make a stop in this game to win it. And that's going to be the difference. It's a 17, 13 final score. See, I think our offense will actually look better because I do think that Trevor Etienne will get more carries. I do think Florida will attempt a couple of downfield shots in this game. I don't even know why I'm saying that because Napier hasn't really given us data to tell me that, but I'm taking a leap of faith in him and assuming he's going to show some of that brain power on Saturday. But I just think that Florida's offense is going to do a little bit more than it's than it's been doing throughout the course of the year so far. I think that Florida has been either saving something or – Napier is going to realize, hey, you know, running the ball on cover zero in seven man boxes just is not going to work. So we have got to adjust and try something else. I think one of those two scenarios will play out. Florida will try at least a couple of downfield shots. And I think Florida will get 28 points as a result. But I mean, would not stun me if we just do the exact same thing we've been doing the last couple of weeks and running the ball on, I don't know, third and sevens and running tiny slants on third and twelves. So I'm gonna gonna take the leap of faith in Napier and and assume that we're gonna see some improvements there. Well, we'll have to see. So make sure to tune in at noon high kickoff there in Lexington. ESPN, Joe Tessator on the call. Can the Gators walk into Lexington and walk out with a victory that will begin a very pivotal three game stretch for the Gators? So with that, that's a show. Thank you all for tuning in. Make sure to like, hit subscribe at the bottom. Leave us a comment, rate, review. Helps us reach you all and bring you additional great content. Be on the lookout for another drop in the in all kinds of weather forecaster rankings this week as we'll have Dustin back on to update that and then give his prediction for the Kentucky game as well as predicting the new games for this coming college football slate. And all kinds of weather forecaster went five and two last week. If you bet with the uh, the forecaster, you would have won money. So definitely continue to tune in to see what that model does as Dustin has been working really hard. And he had mentioned week five was going to be that turning point where you start using data more from what's gone on this season versus past. So tune in for that. We thank you again for tuning in to another episode of the In All Kinds of Weather Forecast. Neil Shulman, Chris Yanes, have a great night and go Gators.